tuning in, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. In our last episode, I recommended some mainstream Christian Bible translations, but I would be remiss if I didn't also review some important Unitarian Bible translations. Although often overlooked, these versions are important because they have the opposite bias when it comes to passages commonly offered as proof text for the Trinity. And this was, as we saw in our previous episodes, an area where unconscious bias really dominated. Also, I asked Dr. Jerry Werewell to join me today since he is a Bible translator, currently working on a Unitarian Bible translation. So for today's episode, we'll review six different Bibles, including the emphatic Diaglot of Benjamin Wilson, the New European Version of Duncan Heaster, the New World Translation by the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Kingdom of God Version by Raymond Faircloth, the One God, the Father, One Man, Messiah translation of Anthony Buzzard, and the Revised English Version that Jerry Weirwill works on. In this episode, we'll offer some background on each of these versions. We're not able to go too in-depth or offer thorough analysis, but in our next episode, we'll compare them and see how they handle a number of interesting texts. Here now is episode 354, Unitarian Bible Translations with Jerry Weirwill. Today we're talking about Unitarian Bible translations, and I'm really happy to have Dr. Jerry Weirwell join me today in the studio. Welcome, Jerry. Thanks. Glad to be here, Sean. And uh, so maybe you could just start us off by explaining what we plan to do. Sure. So when you mentioned that we wanted to review some Unitarian Bible translations, uh, what we mean by that, they're coming from the theology of a Unitarian God, uh, from a monotheistic rather than a Trinitarian multi-person God. So that's the distinction. Uh, We have about six different versions here that come from that sort of a background theologically. And what we'd like to do is just kind of give an overall summation of the history of of the version and uh, some of the information about the translator and some of its purposes. And then in the next episode, we're going to go over the versions with looking at a couple comparative passages to look at some strengths and weaknesses from the versions. So I think that's what we're going to do. All right. Sounds good. Should you say something about your bias, like right at the top Uh, here? Yeah, that'd 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 be good. I find this project particularly interesting because I myself... Uh, work on a Bible project called the Revised English Version, which is going to be one of the versions we review. So I, I am kind of biased toward that version as that's been a lot of the work I've been doing recently. And I think there's a lot of great qualities about that version. So just to put it out there is that sort of I have a conflict of interest uh, in reviewing these because I actually work on the translation committee for one of them. And now you know too. So yeah. <laughs> So long as it's out on the table, I think uh, we can manage with that. So if Jerry ends up concluding that the REV is um, the purest and most elegant translation ever made, uh, just know that uh, that's a direct pat on his own back, (laughs) at least when it comes to certain parts of it. But to begin, I'd like to look at, first of all, the emphatic Diaglot, which is a super old translation done by Benjamin Wilson, one of the founders of the Church of God General Conference. And he did this work in the year 1864, and I got my copy from Charles and Sylvia Botolfs from Hammond, Louisiana. When I went down there to visit, this was back in 2005, Charles just handed me this Bible and, and as like a gift. I hadn't really heard of it before then, maybe a little bit. Didn't know that anybody still used it, but look, if somebody's handing me this, an elder of a church is handing me this in the year 2005, then, you know, obviously, even though this is from 1864, people are still using it, and so therefore, I think it's it's worthwhile to include it. Now, as far as the text that Benjamin Wilson used for this translation, it came from uh, Griesbach, J.J. Griesbach, which is uh, an older Greek text. I mean, this translation was done in 1864, so he was using maybe a, a, a century before him, 
and it was a text that was highly respected, certainly within the mainstream of Greek New Testament texts that have come out over the years. And uh, I'll just read you his full title page, because 1800s titles, and by the way, mustaches, are magnificent. So uh, this is the title of his book. It's full, I should also make a mention, it's full of different fonts, styles, and sizes, which makes it just um, so, so fun to read, and lots of capital letters. Anyhow, it's called The Emphatic Diaglot, containing original Greek text of what is commonly styled the New Testament, according to the recension of Dr. J.J. J. Griesbach, with an interlinear, word-for-word English translation, a new emphatic version, based on the interlinear translation, on the rendering of eminent critics, and on the various readings of the Vatican Manuscript, number 1209 in the Vatican Library, together with illustrative and explanatory footnotes and a copious selection of references to the whole of which is added a valuable alphabetic appendix by Benjamin Wilson. So that uh, that definitely is going to take the title award for um, Bible translations. Yeah, I don't know if any of us can really outdo that. No, no. Today, it's brevity that counts. Like, nobody even says the full name of a translation. It's always just the, the abbreviation, right? Yeah, we go by acronyms now, basically. Right, right. Uh, so I think if you use an acronym for... This Bible, it would be the ED, uh, Emphatic Diaglot. Basically, what Wilson was doing here was making his best effort to put people in touch with the text. And this is not a normal Bible translation. It's got two columns in it. It's got maybe two-thirds of the page is the left column, and one-third is the right column. And And that little right column is his translation, his English translation. And on the left, you have the Greek text itself, right underneath which you have the English translation for each Greek word. Uh, And so that's what we typically call an interlinear anyhow. Uh, But the goal here with him is to, to show and help people see the Greek as much as possible, even though it is focused on English speaking people. Uh, I just want to read a little quote from it. He says, Readers who are familiar with the original tongue obtain in this work one of the best Greek testaments with important ancient readings well worthy of their attention. And it is presumed there are even few Greek scholars who are so far advanced but may derive some help from the translation given. Those who have only a little or no knowledge of the Greek may, by careful reading and a little attention to the interlinearity translation soon become familiar with it. This work, in fact, places in the hands of the intelligent English reader the means of knowing and appropriating for his own benefit with but little labor on his part what has cost others years of study and severe toil to acquire. Uh, So the idea is that he's not just giving you a translation, but he's also showing you how the Greek and English line up and he he adds in this extra layer in his translation of emphasis. It's called an emphatic diaglot. Diaglot means two languages. Emphatic means that he's using a number of different typographical strategies in order to signal emphasis that otherwise wouldn't come through in English that is there in the Greek. There's another emphatic version I've heard of, the the Rotherham emphatic. Rotherham. Rotherham. Rotherham's emphasized Bible. Thank you. Rotherham's emphasized Bible. Yeah, it's the same kind of idea. So anyhow, Wilson, what he does is he uses initial capital letters, italics, small capital letters, and large capital letters to indicate different kinds of emphasis that's present in the original so that there's an emphasized aspect to the English translation. So this Greek text that he used, the Griesbach text, which is really from the 1700s, uh, by today's standards, is outdated. In in his own time, the way he talks about it, it's pretty clear that this was more or less cutting edge. He did this. He finished this translation in 1864. So the much more famous Westcott and Hort text didn't even come out yet. That's not till 1881. Uh, he does mention Tischendorf and Tregellis and a couple of others, Lachman, and some of these other Greek texts. And he's he's very much a fan. 
of Codex Vaticanus. Uh, he mentions it frequently in the footnotes. So, I mean, Wilson is not some podunk guy. I mean, he's like super in touch with where scholarship was at all those many years ago and doing his best to put it in a way so that people could access, non-specialists could access it. So it's really a, a cool Bible, but uh, sadly, because so many of the most important discoveries when it comes to the New Testament occurred not in the 1800s, but in the 1900s, um, his translation doesn't benefit from them. It's, sort of, it's the sort of translation that really you have to use with a grain of salt because the text from which he translated is not as old or as accurate as what we have available today. And this is one of the things I mentioned in my class throughout is that older is not always better when it comes to Bible translations. Some people might think, oh, well, Benjamin Wilson lived 160 years ago, so therefore his translation is going to be more accurate than somebody today. That's totally false. I think if Benjamin Wilson were here today, the first thing he'd say is, look, we need to use the oldest and best manuscripts, and so many of those discoveries were made in the 20th century. So uh, we're really in a, a better position today, but that doesn't mean you, you can't consult it, you can't benefit from it. A lot of the times, if the Greek is the same as what we have today, his translation would be something to consider. So that's just a little bit about his translation. We'll come back to it once we uh, get to our next part of this series and consider some of the different verses that are of interest. Well, that was a wonderful introduction to the ED. And I'd like to then talk about a more recent version, which is the New European Version commonly known as the NEV. Not to be confused with the NIV. Yes, very different. <laughs> very different indeed. And, and this version is actually a version put together uh, by the Christadelphian Church and is led by Duncan Heaster, one of its main writers and proponents. And in the preface, it explains that this version, the New European Version, isn't actually really a translation per se. Uh, they call it a remediation into modern English of the KJV, the King James Version, and the RV, the Revised Version, not to be confused with the Bible that I work on called the Revised English Version. And so they do this in order to provide a text, they say, that's familiar to most English readers, and they try to also cater the language to readers of English that it's not their primary language. Uh, and to that end, then, the version is designed, it says, to be an evangelistic tool. And what I interpret that to mean is basically the Bible is used in other countries, lot, largely in missionary efforts to try to convert people to Christianity. But there's another unique feature about this Bible is that it offers extensive footnotes. You could probably almost even categorize it as a study Bible. And the footnotes, I think, are the primary evangelistic tool for the Christadelphian church with the NEV because it outlines a lot of their theology and explanations defending uh, some of their tenets of the faith that differ from other mainstream Christian beliefs and even from other biblical Unitarian or Unitarian beliefs in general. And so there's also in the back a large appendix, which is a condensed version of one of Duncan Heaster's uh, most famous works, uh, called Bible Basics. And it's kind of like his, uh, it's not a systematic theology, but it's a theological overview uh, of Christadelphian beliefs. And so they offer that in the back to sort of uh, guide the reader uh, to, to understand the scriptures uh, through the lens of a, of a Christadelphian framework. Uh, and so that's printed in the back of the Bible. As an additional note, uh, there is commentary in the footnotes of the NEV Bible, but a more full and complete commentary by Duncan Heaster is available at n-e-v.info, where you can also read the NEV Bible online, and those are published as of 2018. Now, the, this version uh, came out as the New Testament uh, on its own, but then in recent times, the entire Bible has been published, and the one I'm holding in my hand, uh, I believe, is the most recent printing of 2013. And it's an entire Bible, Old and New Testament, uh, with footnotes that are more extensive in the New Testament than the Old Testament. But all in all, um, a very nicely published volume here. And uh, one that uh, we'd say probably is uh, more like a, a revised 
uh, version from a previous translation than it is a fresh translation. So as we compare this uh, version with the other ones, we'll probably touch on some of those aspects in the next episode. Moving on then to our next version, which is the New World Translation. And this is the translation done by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York, also just commonly called the Jehovah's Witnesses. It was published in the year 1950. I should mention that the emphatic diaglot is also published by the Watchtower. And that's an, that's an interesting fact of history that the Jehovah's Witnesses so liked Benjamin Wilson's translation that, that they were the ones that were publishing it for so many years, right up into the 1940s. Uh, but then in, in 1950, the Jehovah's Witnesses decided they needed their own translation, and so they came out with the, their New Testament and then the whole Bible in 1961, and they published 220 million copies in 187 languages in whole or part of the New World Translation. I mean, these are just astronomical numbers. If somebody sells a million copies of a book, it's a big deal. I mean, 220 million copies. Just incredible. And, and what's more, it's like impossible to buy them. You know, I was, I was going online, Jerry, just to get the, the update, because my New World Translation, which I got by uh, cajoling a Jehovah's Witness to give me a freebie, is from 1984. And so I don't have the 2013, so I'm like going all over the internet trying to buy a 2013 New World Translation. You just can't do it. It's like the Jehovah's Witnesses don't sell it. Amazon sells it, but like it's not clear which version it is, like what year. So Seems like you really had to go hunting for that. Yeah, so like I, I had to take a risk on one that like might be another 1984, but hopefully it's the 2013. So anyhow, I guess you have to, you got to like join or something in order to <laughs> get access to the goodies. But it's an interesting translation. The most recent edition, as I mentioned, is uh, 2013. They've already translated that just over the last seven years into 31 languages. They, they do not specify their source text, like uh, so many translations, sadly. Um, they, they just don't even tell you what they're working with, or, or at least I couldn't find it. So if, it's, if it is there somewhere, it's buried. Their philosophy does shine through a little bit better, though, uh, because uh, what they say is that they want to have uh, a reliable translation, and that's really their goal is they don't feel that other translations are being as honest with the text as they should be. And so the New World Translation is an effort to, I would say, be more literal a lot of times. This, these are some of the points that they make. It's like four or five points that they say are important to them in this translation. One is it sanctifies God's name by restoring it to its rightful place in the Scriptures. Uh, so that's number one on their list of what they say they're doing. And so the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that we should call God, at least if we're English-speaking, we should call God Jehovah. And so they do not use Lord to substitute for Yahweh or Jehovah in the Old Testament. They always will render it Jehovah, which I think is great, to be honest. If I'm just going to be honest and say my opinion, I think it's great to have God's name be God's name in the Old Testament. I think it's the most honest thing you can do, and there's lots of other versions that do that too these days, not nearly as many as there should be. But then they go a step further, and they bring the name Jehovah into the New Testament, even though all of our known Greek manuscripts use the word Lord when quoting the word Kyrios, when quoting the Old Testament name Yahweh. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, have, a, have a different understanding of that, a different theory, and so they in, insert the word Jehovah, even though the Greek text has Lord there, and so you have a lot of Jehovah in the New Testament as well, and that's uh, distinctive of this translation. To be honest, I don't know of any other translation that does that in the New Testament. So their second point is they accurately convey the original message that was inspired by God, so they're very much a high inspiration kind of uh, perspective. Number three, they're translating expressions literally when the wording and structure of the target language allow for such renderings of the original language text. But then they're going to communicate the correct sense of a word or a phrase when a literal rendering would distort or obscure the meaning. So this, this reminds me of the old NRSV saying, as literal as possible, as free as necessary. 
and uh, that's certainly what they're saying here. They're, they're essentially prioritizing literalness in translation as much as possible, but recognizing that that's not always possible, in which case they will move to more of a dynamic translation. And then last, uh, they mention using a natural, easy-to-understand language that encourages reading. And uh, so that's, that's their goal. Uh, when we look at, in our next episode, some of the different specific texts, we'll, we'll see how they do with that. But, you know, just like the Christadelphian NEV, the Jehovah's Witnesses NWT, is going to spin the text in the direction of their core doctrines, obviously. So, you know, if you're going to use either one of these, it's important that you are aware of what those doctrines are. Um, And we don't honestly have the time to get into that here. That's a little bit about the New World Translation. What do we have next, Jerry? The next Bible here is the One God, the Father, One Man, Messiah Translation. It's a little bit of an a extended title for a, a Bible. Uh, most Bibles are abbreviated with a three-letter, or in the Diglot's case, a two-letter acronym. Uh, here we have a seven-letter acronym to describe the Bible. O-G-F-O-M-M-T. This is a, a translation of solely the New Testament, uh, done by Sir Anthony Buzzard of Restoration Fellowship. Uh, Anthony Buzzard has been part of the Church of God of the Abrahamic faith uh, for many years and has produced a translation uh, that really focuses on a few key critical aspects of the New Testament. I'd like to read a couple excerpts from his introduction that help to kind of expose what his goal is and motivation in producing this translation. But first, I'd like to remark that uh, he did a combination of reworking some existing public domain uh, Bible versions and also did some fresh translation from the Greek text. And uh, he conveyed to me that uh, his base text for the the Greek was the Westcott and Hort of 1881, which um, about 100 years ago was one of the predominant critical Greek texts available. But uh, since the emergence of the Nestle Alon and other critical texts in more recent times, uh, the Westcott and Hort is no longer used among scholarship, uh, as a lot of the discoveries uh, from the papyri uh, in the early 20th century has helped to refine the critical Greek text even further. So in the introduction here, uh, Buzzard basically points out that the OGFOMMT Bible Um, is seeking to try to restore the notion that Jesus was a Jew and that uh, his claim to the Messiahship uh, is the central part of the kingdom message. And that a lot of modern versions, um, unfortunately, have a very strong Greek philosophical influence. He says here that this translation has as its premise, the conviction that the church today in its preaching, teaching, and tradition generally gives you a strongly Greek philosophically influenced version of the New Testament. And so in his translation, uh, Buzzard is seeking to try to undo some of that influence and try to have a, a more Jewish, which, which would be arguably a, a more consistent view of the time, Uh, of the Bible's writing in the first century would be more consistent with that rather than a later uh, second, third, and fourth century where a lot of Greek thought and influence did filter into the church. And so his criticisms of of modern versions uh, read something like this. He says translations, particularly some of the modern ones like the NIV, which is the New International Version, they, quote, help the reader to see things in the New Testament which reinforce his or her impression that later, quote, orthodoxy is solidly biblical. But this involves, quote, pushing the Greek text beyond what it actually says. So Buzzard's uh, criticism of a lot of modern versions is that they're inflating the text beyond what it's actually saying in order to try to substantiate uh, church teachings. And the downfall is that as people read these modern versions and they read some of the inflations, conflations of the text, they begin to think that they are actually part of the Bible. And and that's the detriment that he's trying to correct. And we have certainly seen that in the the class 
preceding the, this episode, specifically the five episodes I did on bias and Bible translation. So, so I suppose what Anthony is doing here is very much correcting that bias by removing it and then also maybe adding in his own bias. <laughs> I think every translation has bias to some degree, right? Yeah, every translation requires a framework uh, within which the translator operates, and so you can't have, there's no such thing as an unbiased translation. It just doesn't exist, because we all actually have to have a way of looking at the scripture in order to uh, bring it from the original language into the receptor language, uh, like English. Uh, And so Anthony says here that he says, quote, my hope is to bring into clear focus the very uncomplicated New Testament definition of God as the father of Jesus and certainly not as triune. Uh, These translations, the modern ones he refers to, they mostly convey the sense of the Greek in varied but entirely acceptable ways. However, in certain key passages, he says they misrepresent the Greek text. In an effort to portray Jesus as God the Son, the second member of an eternal trinity. So I think that's Buzzard's primary purpose is to produce a text that shows Jesus as the the son of God, the Jewish Messiah, uh, a human divinely conceived by God, not as an incarnated God himself, uh, part of a three-person Godhead. So he's looking to try to translate the Bible so that, that that focus and then that meaning of the text that he sees there comes out clearly. And his second major emphasis, though, is to bring out what he is stressing as the gospel of the kingdom. And so he's, he sees that in the a lot of modern translations, the focus on the kingdom message really isn't prominent. And he feels that it really should be. And that when translating uh, the Greek word euangelion as either good news or gospel, if you change the way you translate it, like in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and then you translate it differently, for example, in like Paul's writings, he says that that actually does a disservice to people thinking that somehow the euangelion is actually changed it's different, that there's two different ones or something like that. And he's like, no, there's only the gospel message of the kingdom. It's a unity. And so he uh, has made a concerted effort to try to remind the readers of the monotheistic faith of the New Testament and the central point of the gospel of the kingdom. Along with the text, there's also a considerable amount of footnotes that go along with it that explains complicated passages Uh, and also emphasizes particular theological motifs like the gospel of the kingdom message. And so the New Testament uh, has has quite a few places to find further information uh, below the text as Anthony is trying to explain the text for the reader to understand um, more depth about the scriptures and also sometimes the justification for certain translation choices. The OGF OMMT originally came out in 2014 in hard copy, But actually, as we speak right now, a a new second edition is at the printer being published. And Anthony was gracious enough to send me a digital copy. And so we're able to, in the next episode, as we compare the versions, be able to look at the the second version, which is coming out in 2020. So really excited about that. Uh, A unique feature of this version is that uh, it's a combination of Anthony taking some paraphrasing to bring out the meaning of the text, but also taking having some translation from the Greek text. Therefore, it's a it's kind of a mashup. Um, but overall, the feel of it is is very much uh, in the realm of a paraphrased Bible, uh, trying to amplify the meaning and, and uh, try to clarify some complicated concepts. That can be helpful and detrimental. Helpful in the sense that the average Bible reader a lot of times is not as informed as they really should be uh, about the biblical world and the biblical text. You know, our our culture in, in the West, especially like in the United States, is becoming more and more biblically illiterate, really, and uh, becoming more difficult for them to get in touch with the ancient world. Uh, and so the advantage of that is to actually bring out some important nuances of the of the text. The downside, though, is that when you make those interpretive decisions for the reader, you exclude other possibilities, and especially if there's disagreement on on what those views are, uh, you take a, a position um, one way versus a different way. Uh, whereas if you had a, a more uh, simplified 
uh, version of the text. Uh, it would allow ambiguity um, and also allow the reader to uh, grapple with the text themselves rather than doing the interpretation for them. And, and we'll see that as we go through these different verses as well. You know, like I mentioned with other paraphrastic style translations, such as the Message uh, and the Passion translation, which I had reviewed in my uh, previous class, if your bias is the same as the translators, you're not going to see anything wrong with it. <laughs> the issue comes up when is when you have a difference of doctrine with the translator, and then you're, you're going to be upset with the translation. So uh, that is certainly part of the risk involved here. I should also mention that in uh, looking at he, his 2014 edition, he does say, uh, just going back to the Greek text, he does say, using the standard Greek manuscripts as base, and then he puts in parentheses, the text edited by Bruce Metzger. My hope is to bring into clear focus the very uncomplicated New Testament definition of God and, and so on. You know, I know that he had mentioned to you Westcott and Hort, but Bruce Metzger is a full century later, so maybe there's some question here as to what the Greek is that he used. Yeah, it seems like there might be a discrepancy on that, so maybe maybe he misspoke. Yeah, I can't say for sure on that. We'll have to wait and see if he gets in contact with us. I think it is a significant issue, though, uh, because if you're big difference. Yeah, if you're using an outdated text, it doesn't matter how good your translation is. It's it's still going to have certain flaws in it. All right, so moving on then to our next translation, which is the KGV, not the KJV, but the KGV, and uh, this is the Kingdom of God version of the New Testament by Raymond Faircloth published in 2013, and uh, he is pretty clear about his source text, which was, uh, int interestingly enough, an interlinear. It's called the New Greek-English Interlinear New Testament, which has the Greek of the Nestle Elan 26th edition, and it's a, a work completed by Robert Brown and Philip Comfort. This represents a third translation style or methodology, I guess we could say. We have some translations that are not really translations, they're revisions of English versions, right? Like the, the new European version is not starting from the text, is it? Uh, the NE, NEV is a what they call remediation of the KJV and RV. Okay. So there, it's basically just an update of English language. Right. It's a revision of an English translation. Okay. Whereas the emphatic diaglot and the New World translation are both legitimate, like straight from the Greek to the English. In fact, the emphatic diaglot is, you know, he's generating an interlinear and a translation. So Wilson was definitely an overachiever in that category. Whereas the OGF OMMT is a revision partly and then partly a translation, which is why you use the term mashup. And whereas I think what we have with Raymond Faircloth's translation is really none of those. What, what he's doing is using an interlinear, uh, which is sort of like halfway between a translation and a revision. Um, and uh, so that, that, is, that is interesting as well. His philosophy for translating is to avoid traditional jargonistic terms, as he calls it. His stated goal is to render, quote, the inspired Christian documents in good, plainly understandable contemporary English, but without resorting to paraphrasing of the Greek, although on some occasions a thought-for-thought thought dynamic equivalence rendering is given. So the KGV is, this is still uh, Faircloth's explanation, so the KGV is an essentially, but not overly literal, version. The KGV keeps as close to the structure of the Greek as good flowing English will permit, hopefully without being either difficult or cumbersome for the reader, uh, end quote. So this is his stated goal, and it's published with an extensive appendix as well, where he talks about verb tenses and issues with prepositions, and he has this kind of interesting comparison table where he puts side by side a transliteration of a Greek phrase, the traditional rendering you'll find in most versions, and then how he did it in the KGV, so that you know it's it's very easy to see what translation decisions 
from a vocabulary and phrasing perspective he made. So, for example, the traditional rendering of the word saints, he translates as God's holy people or fellow believers or the holy ones. Instead of grace, he translates gracious favor or divine favor. Instead of parables, he translates that word illustrations, comparisons. So, you know, th- this is what he's trying to do. He's trying to av- avoid language that a non-Christian wouldn't already have on board when they encounter Scripture. Because, like, the word parable is, is totally old hat for any anyone that's been to church a bunch. But uh, if you're coming from a non-Christian perspective, picking up a Bible randomly, uh, you're not going to know what a parable is. I mean, some people will, but a lot of people won't. So that's kind of his focus. He's a little more evangelistic in that sense and also a, a much more literal translation than uh, a number of these other ones are. And just looking at this version, thumbing through it, I can see that it's a clean text. There are no footnotes at all in it. There are no study notes. Uh, but he does use some symbols, like an asterisk and a couple of other symbols, that then refer the reader to uh, a section in the back that gives notes on significant word and phrase choices. Uh, so it is it is a clean text, but it does also have some of those marginalia, but they're, they're reserved for the... Uh, they're, they're, they're transformed into end notes rather than right in line with the text. All right, Jerry, what do we have next? Well, now we get to move on to my favorite Bible version, the Revised English Version. The REV Bible Project actually is in its 20th year right now. It's a a Bible version produced by Spirit and Truth Fellowship. And uh, about 20 years ago, uh, one of the founding members, John Shaneheit, uh, began working on a Bible version that helped to elucidate uh, some of the distinctives of biblical Unitarianism in the translation as he got tired of having to explain away the scriptures as he was teaching from the King James Version originally and then moving on to the NIV uh, and others, more modern versions as well. The REV had its first publication in hard copy in 2013, and I actually joined the translation team in 2015. I've been working on it for about five years, and the 2013 version and the current Uh, version that we're working on uh, differ significantly in the way that they've been produced. The original 2013 version is largely a revision of the American Standard Version from 1901, which is a publicly available uh, Bible uh, version. And a lot of it was updating language, but also attempting to clarify some difficult passages as well. So it's, it's also, in a sense, a little bit of a mashup where it's a revision from a previous version, but then also there is some fresh translation components to it. Uh, Since 2015, I've been working to revise the Revised English Version, uh, translating it from the (laughs) Nestle Elan 28th edition. So you're going to call it the RREV when you're done? Maybe the (laughs) NREV. The Revised, Revised English Version. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, I work from the Nestle Elan 28th edition critical Greek text and uh, largely going through and doing a uh, new translation. And uh, then... Uh, what happens is uh, we compare the text with uh, the 2013 version and make adjustments uh, as necessary. Uh, sometimes the translation is good as it is, but uh, there have been hundreds upon hundreds of translations, and uh, we've only been working through the letters of Paul at the moment, um, and then some of the Gospels as well. So it's been a, a little bit of a um, long review project, uh, and we still have a couple years to go on it. But uh, it's now currently available at revisedenglishversion.com. And if you want it on a mobile device as well, we have an app available, the REV Bible app, um, which you can download for free and and use. Uh, One thing to say about the REV Bible is that we have kept all footnotes to mostly uh, textual issues in the text, uh, we don't really have any comments in the actual footnotes themselves. There is an extensive commentary that has been produced to go along with the Bible, um, 
And that's available um, through hyperlink on various verses um, through the website and the app itself, but is not part of the actual text. So we've uh, attempted to keep those distinct elements um, where if somebody wants to study the text itself, uh, that's available in a clean version. But then if they want to investigate and find out why certain translation decisions were made or kind of the thoughts from John or myself on certain passages of the Bible, they can click on the verses and follow the hyperlink to the commentary section. Yeah, and uh, just just for full disclosure, we did roughly go in order of uh, published year here as we were going through. That was kind of like our scheme. It's a little tricky because so many of these versions came out in the year 2013. Uh, <laughs> but um, the REV is is a version that is dynamically updated, right, Jerry? I mean, it, like from one week to another, you could go to it online, and it's different. Yeah, we're doing the review process in real time, right? And the updates are instantaneous, right? So uh, that's definitely a distinctive about this particular version. And what's interesting about it too is that it's a revision becoming a translation. One other thing that's interesting about it is that unlike uh, Benjamin Wilson and Anthony Buzzard and Raymond Faircloth and Duncan Heaster, uh, this more aligns with the New World Translation in the sense that there is a committee of translators. This is not a single translator version. Um, Even the stuff that you do, Jerry, uh, is then reviewed and there's uh, a process involved. It's not just like you say this is the way it is and that's the end of it, right? Yeah, I didn't give this background information, but there's been actually over a dozen people who have worked on the Revised English Version Bible Project over the years. And currently we have uh, a three-member team consisting of John Shaneheit as I guess you could call the general editor. And then um, I'm the New Testament associate. And Bill Schlegel is actually... Uh, has been working for the past year or so with the Old Testament. But before us, there have been uh, about a dozen other people who have really contributed to this work. So it is it really is a committee-based, multi-person project. And to be able to be uh, doing all this work, it, it's it's time-consuming, as I'm sure any Bible translator can tell you. These, these type of things are not quick going. And uh, what I really do enjoy about the committee aspect is that uh, I think if I was just producing my own Bible— uh, I don't think it would be as high a quality. I think that there is a, a refining process when you have multiple people looking at the work and weighing in on it. And to make one more comment about the process is that we use a translation methodology that is typically referred to as uh, optimal equivalence translation methodology, where rather than trying to stick exactly literal to the Greek text, as for example, um, like the King James Version would be quite literal, the NASB would be quite literal. Um, ESV. The ESV is is pretty literal, but it's it's a little bit looser in its literalness. Um, we've tried to uh, be able to stick close to the text as long as it communicates to a contemporary English audience effectively. Um, if not, we've been willing to translate a little more idiomatically. And this would be kind of like where the Christian Standard Bible or the New English Translation Bibles would lie, where they are willing to massage the language a little bit in English so that the sense of the passage is smoother and just more easily understood uh, by the reader and and not so wooden or stiff. Yeah. Uh, So would you say that in comparison to the NET and the CSB, the REV is pretty much the same? Or would you say that generally it's literal and only when there is a need for it do you go into the idiomatic style? Because I think the CSB and the NET are almost like relentlessly dynamic. They're they're much stronger in their okay. use of idiomatic language. I think in the REV we try to retain a, a stronger sense of the literalness. Okay. And another another component that we tried to to have pulled out from the text is to keep some of the biblicalisms. You know, certain things like idioms such as uh, walking somewhere was a very common biblical expression for what it meant to. Uh, how you lived, your manner of life. I see. You know, and rather yeah. than saying, you know, watch the way that watch the way you live, 
we would say, you know, watch the way that you walk, because that that's what the Bible is saying. And that's a really kind of interesting dimension of the biblical world. And so we try to retain some of those elements. Also, one other unique feature that I, I really do like about the REV is that we've restored the name of Yahweh, or Yahweh, or however you want to pronounce <laughs> the name of God in the Old Testament. Wherever you see the Tetragrammaton, uh, we have used the personal name of God. And we uh, I, I don't know of any other modern Bible version that really has done a complete reinstitution of God's personal name. However, the NEV Bible also restores the name of God and uses Yahweh throughout the Old Testament. So I think that that's a, a great feature for that Bible as well. Well, actually, Jerry, that's interesting because out of the six translations we've just looked at here, three of them are New Testament only. Benjamin Wilson, Raymond Faircloth, and Anthony Buzzard, and then three of them are full Bible. Out of the three that are full Bible that have an Old Testament in them, as well as the New Testament, the New World Translation, of course, uses Jehovah yeah. all over the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament also uses Jehovah, even though that is not in the Greek text, as I mentioned, whereas both the NEV and the REV do have Yahweh as well. So I think uh, Unitarian Bible translations are sensitive to this issue and do care a good deal to bring it to bring out God's name as as much as possible. So there you have it, folks. Uh, six Unitarian Bible versions: the the emphatic diglot, the Kingdom of God version, the New World Translation, the New European Version. The One God, the Father, One Man, Messiah translation, and the Revised English Version. These uh, Bibles, um, we're all looking forward to comparing the text a little more closely in the next episode. But we just want to give you guys some background on where these versions came from and some of the initial uh, ideas about how they were translated and some of the potential strengths and weaknesses that they offer to the reader. Okay, well, I hope you found this episode helpful. I wonder... Do you have any of these translations? If so, do you use them? Come on to restitutio.org and find episode 354, Unitarian Bible Translations, part one, and let me know your thoughts or questions. Also, let me know if there's any specific verse you'd like us to cover in next week's episode. We have a list that we're fairly certain about, but uh, we're definitely open to suggestions there. Also, we got a new review. <laughs> This is from W. W. Julio D., who gave us a five-star rating and who wrote the following. Have enjoyed listening while cycling or running, good brain food, especially enjoy episodes with guest speakers, and also enjoy the current issue topics. The series on the origins of the Bible and the translations has been excellent. Keep up the fine podcast, Sean. Thank you. Well, thank you for writing in. I certainly appreciate that. I totally agree with the idea of listening to podcasts while cycling or running. I feel the same way. You won't, you won't catch me watching long YouTube lectures pretty much ever, but I will listen to podcasts for hours and hours if I'm on a long drive or going for a long run or if I'm on the bike or working around the house. I totally, uh, I totally agree with you, and hopefully Rest Studio is something you could take along with you. If, by the way, if you're listening to this on the website and not in your device, you can get a podcast app in your phone or your tablet. Uh, just type in podcast and then uh, look up Rest Studio. It'll be in there. We're on Spotify. We're in Apple Podcasts. Google is just now launching a new podcasting service. They got rid of Google Play, and that now they have Google Podcasts. We're already on there. So whatever it is you listen on, whether it's one of those recording everything you do and then you talk to it, devices, I don't know what they're called, home devices, audio home devices, we're on there. You can get Rest Studio there. And uh, if you are a regular listener, by the way, to Rest Studio, and wouldn't mind leaving a review in Apple Podcasts, I know it's a hassle, but uh, we sure would appreciate it. Why not head on over there today? This is a great way to support this ministry. Or even just sharing episodes on social media is a big help. So thanks to so many of you who have already done this. Uh, I think we have like 80-something ratings in Apple Podcasts. And then, uh, of course, not all of those have reviews. Those are just somebody puts the stars in. We have had a couple of negative ratings. Uh, I think I have a couple of one-star ratings and maybe one two-star. But 
overwhelmingly, we do have five star ratings, which is which is really great. Um, I think it's about a four point eight. Uh, but wouldn't it be great to get to a 4.9? Uh, so, you know, if you haven't done this this silly star thing yet, please <laughs> please log in and do that if it's not too much to ask. Uh, again, thanks to so many of you who have already done this, who have shared this, who have supported this. Our audience is increasing week by week, uh, and, and this is really exciting to see. Uh, we'll see you next week as we are back on our regular one-episode-per-week schedule. Uh, we have been doing two per week for about three months here, and I, for one, am very happy to get back to, as of th- as of today forward, uh, just releasing episodes on Thursday nights, so it'll be in your device Friday morning. So when you take that extended weekend road trip, don't forget to listen to a new Restitutio episode or old ones. We've got 350-plus episodes now available for free for anyone in the world. So thanks, everyone. I'll catch you next Thursday. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.